Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. During 2021, the State Historical Society is commemorating the upcoming 175th anniversary of Iowa's statehood. In March, which is Iowa History Month, the Iowa History 101 webinar series expands to every Tuesday and Thursday. You can hear more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today we will learn about the role that the Iowa National Guard played in the Spanish-American War from 1898 to 1899. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are now available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague Matt Beyer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Mike Vogt. Mike is the curator for the Iowa Gold Star Military Museum at Camp Dodge in Johnston. He has both his bachelor's and master's degrees in history from the University of Northern Iowa. Mike has published articles on Iowa and military history in magazines, newspapers, journals, and books, including Iowa Heritage Illustrated, The Iowan, Des Moines Register, Iowa History Journal, and the Biographical Dictionary of Iowa. His past work experience includes working for the His Historical Society of Marshall County, Living History Farms, and the Center for American Archaeology in Illinois. In addition, he has taught as an adjunct history professor at Grandview University, Simpson College, and Buena Vista University. Mike is a licensed pilot who enjoys flying and giving rides. A native of Gladbrook, Iowa, he lives in Des Moines. And now I'm very happy to turn it over to Mike to begin the webinar. Uh, good day, uh, glad you were able to tune in. I, I'm gonna presume that my uh, volume level is okay. If not, I suspect somebody will let me know uh, today's topic is the role of the Iowa National Guard in the Spanish-American War. So, oh, sorry. There we go. Thank you. Today's topic, as you can see, is the uh, role of the Iowa National Guard in the Spanish-American War. Uh, many of you might remember from your own readings and studies or uh, classes in high school or college is that we, uh, we enter into a war with the Spanish in April of 1898. Uh, primarily based on the way that they treated uh, uh, their, their subjects in Cuba. The Spanish treated their subjects in Cuba, and there were some diplomatic incidences along the way that uh, led to the decline of, of diplomatic relations with, with uh, the Kingdom of Spain. And one of, the more pro one of the primary ones was the destruction of the battleship Maine in Havana Harbor on the 15th of February, 1898. Uh, three Iowans were aboard that vessel, a little over 60 would eventually perish as a result of that uh, explosion. Uh, it was never, it was concluded afterward that it was the result of a Spanish mine, but those conclusions were a, a product of their time and uh, more than likely what happened to that vessel is that it uh, exploded as the result of spontaneous combustion of coal, which heated a bulkhead aboard the vessel uh, that was next to a powder magazine, uh, ammunition storage compartment, and that that, as they say, cooked off the ammunition, caused that to explode and uh, destroyed the vessel. Uh, you can see there in that slide, the wreckage of the, uh, the, battle, the battleship Maine. And uh, that really, uh, really was one of the, the leading elements to uh, us declaring war with Spain. Uh, the Navy Board of Inquiry that investigated the disaster concluded that it was the result of of uh, the Spanish not providing adequate security and we held them uh, responsible for the, the Maine's destruction. Uh, President William McKinley, he was a veteran of the Civil War. Uh, he did not want a war with Spain, but congressional pressure from both the Senate and uh, the House of Representatives uh, eventually pushed the United States into a position where uh, it tells the Spanish that uh, they need to um, 
they need to uh, stop fighting the revolutionaries in Spain and there were Americans sending them weapons and guns and money and support uh, that the, the revolution in Spain uh, was to cease. And if they could not do it, the United States would intervene with military forces to do so for them and bring an end to the hostilities in Cuba. The American army in 1898 numbered about 38,000 soldiers and there are about 114,000 in the, the National Guard, not only the Iowa National Guard, but all of the state's National Guards. And so when we go to war, uh, the United States taps its military assets, which includes the regular army units and the state volunteers. Uh, President McKinley puts out a call in, uh, in, in May of 1898 for 125,000 volunteers and then later follows up with another request for 75,000 volunteers. And most of those units, most of those personnel are already serving in National Guard units. So the National Guard had a pretty good reputation up to that time as far as its training and its uh, abilities and capabilities. Uh, armories were scattered across the state uh, from, from north to south, east and west. And those units are uh, ordered to report to their armories on the 25th of April, 1898, uh, the day that the United States declares war on Spain. And the next day they all entrain and by the end of April 26, they're all down in uh, the state, they're all assembling at the state fairgrounds, uh, going into the cow barns, horse barns, pitching their tents. And it is dubbed, uh, Camp McKinley in honor of President McKinley at the state fairgrounds. Uh, during their training there, uh, they were visited by a number of dignitaries. The gentleman with the top hat that you can see that you can see is Governor Shaw, and the gentleman in the middle is uh, Adjutant General Byers, who was the commanding general of the Iowa National Guard at the time. Uh, you can see here a company from the Second Iowa Infantry in Fairfield. This is the day. This is was taken, uh, probably not far from the depot building or wherever they had assembled. And you'll notice that some of the folks in the background, some of the new inductees, don't even have uniforms yet, and some of the ones that had been serving for a while did. The uh, the, the personnel that you see there would entrain from Fairfield, and like I said, would be in in uh, Des Moines at the State Fairgrounds, east of the Metro. Uh, by the end of the day on that, uh, the date that was taken, 26 April, 1898. The uh, commanding officer in charge of training there was a Civil War veteran, Brigadier General James Rush Lincoln. Lincoln was a native of Maryland and he uh, served in the, the Maryland Cavalry as a Confederate Cavalry Sergeant during the Civil War. He arrives in Iowa in the 1880s. He founds the first national, he sets up the first National Guard company in Boone, Iowa, and his uh, ability and skill as a soldier and his mastery of infantry and cavalry tactics uh, and the manuals uh, pertaining to uh, led him later to be hired by Iowa State College to teach uh, military tactics at that institution. And so he is the perfect selection. He had combat experience from the Civil War and he knew the methodologies required to get the Iowa National Guard units up to speed and ready for induction into the right in, as US volunteers. It's a shot at Camp McKinley at the state fairgrounds. You can see uh, some of the soldiers lined up there on the street. Uh, as they began the process of inducting soldiers from the National Guard, not only Iowa, but from other states, they ran into a, a, a bit of a constitutional conundrum in that or a legislative conundrum, maybe a little of both, that National Guard troops, their intent was not to be deployed outside the United States to fight foreign wars. Their job was to guard the nation, hence their name, the National Guard. And so as they pondered that, uh, they decided that they would get around that obstacle by having all of the National Guardsmen resign from the National Guard and assume service as US volunteers. And for those of you that are Civil War aficionados, that's exactly how the Civil War militia units from Iowa were absorbed into the unit Union Army during the Civil War. Uh, the units in Iowa were, were divided into four regiments. The first coming primarily from Northeast Iowa, the second from Southeast Iowa, 
the third from Southwest Iowa and the fourth from Northwest Iowa. When they absorb those units into the Army as Iowa volunteers, they pick up the regimental numbering that was concluded at the end of the Civil War, which ended at 48 units being absorbed into the unit Army, sorry, into the Union Army. And so they, they pick up that numbering system. So the first becomes the 49th, the second becomes the 50th, the third becomes the 51st, and the fourth becomes the 52nd Iowa Infantry Volunteers. Uh, they adapt uh, readily to their, their new surroundings at Fort Des Moines. There were people that came to visit them. They brought them chicken. They brought them cakes and pies and things like that. But the, uh, the primary mission of training them did not go uh, by the wayside. Uh, uh, General Lincoln had them uh, marching and training and drilling uh, as, as far north as where Grandview College is by along Four Mile Creek. They had a lot of uh, fake battles, which in the parlance of the time were called sham battles or mock battles. And uh, within a, a few months, they have them ready for induction as U.S. volunteers. Uh, again, you can see uh, on the left there are some soldiers standing. Uh, not all of them ha are, are uniformly equipped or ready to go. This, uh, these images come from two stereo cards that we have in the collection. And you can see a field kitchen there to the right, uh, a coal-fired stove. Uh, some soldiers there, and again, a young man uh, must have been adopted as a mascot or something, uh, visited the camp, uh, and they, they equipped him with uh, a uniform, again, taken at Camp McKinley, 1898. Uh, we see troops here from the 52nd Iowa Volunteer Infantry. They're the first ones to leave the camp. They uh, are inducted by a, a, a regular Army officer, last name of Olmstead, and uh, they will leave Camp McKinley and they will travel down to Camp Chickamauga Park, Georgia. Here's a shot. Uh, these are look like soldiers, not commissioned officers from the 49th Iowa Infantry. Uh, the 49th Iowa Infantry, they end up traveling down to Jacksonville, Florida after they are inducted as U.S. volunteers. The weapons that they're carrying are uh, Model 18, I think they're Model 1886 Craig, or sorry, uh, Springfield trapdoor rifles. They were single shot repeating weapons, fired black powder. Uh, the, the National Guard was not equipped similarly to the regular army. The regular army by that time was were carrying bolt action rifles. And as a result, beginning in the 1890s, the National Guard units across the United States began to get the hand-me-downs from the regular army and these weapons here, these uh, trapdoor Springfields, are exactly what those are. Uh, accurate rifles, but uh, with the, with the, the non-smokeless powder, uh, it would give your position away when fired. Uh, Company B of the 49th, again, down in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, they called it Camp Cuba Libra or Cuba Liberty. And you can see they must have adopted another mascot uh, when they got down there. We can see a youngster sitting in the front row there. They equipped him with a uniform. The, uh, another, another shot here, the 49th at Camp, uh, Camp Cuba Libra. They deploy in December 1898 and they serve in Cuba uh, sailing there aboard the, the U.S. transport Mini, Mini Waska, and they arrive in December of 1898, and they undertake uh, uh, occupation duties. They guard uh, infrastructures, uh, bridges, uh, supply houses, things like that, uh, following the collapse of the Spanish government in Cuba. So they help provide security in, in many ways, like the National Guard today uh, has been deployed to help provide security in different areas. Uh, National Guard units have been doing that since 1898. Uh, this is a shot of them at their base in Marianew, Cuba in the spring of 1898. The 49th Iowa was the only unit to deploy to, to Cuba. Uh, they did not see combat against the Spanish. The war in Cuba ends in August of 1898. And uh, they go down there basically, like I said, for uh, security and uh, uh, as an occupation force. Uh, company, or sorry, the 50th Iowa Volunteer Infantry, they leave uh, Camp McKinley at the state fairgrounds. Uh, 
and they traveled down also to Camp Cuba Libra in Jacksonville, Florida. The 50th will not deploy to anywhere. They, they end up staying uh, there until about October, October of 1898. The one enemy that all of the regiments fight is disease, and the big killer among them is typhoid fever. Almost every regiment loses in the ballpark of between 40 and 50 soldiers as a result of disease. Typhoid goes back, uh, goes back in American military history to the Revolutionary War. Washington's troops lost, uh, uh, they lost Washington's troops. Uh, uh, some of them died as a result of typhoid fever. So that's a, that's a big killer among the units that mobilized for the Spanish-American War and the Iowa Guard units were not, uh, no pun intended, immune from that uh, disease, that fever at all. It's another shot of the of camp there at uh, Jacksonville. You'll notice how how tight they are. So the transmission of the of the uh, typhoid it happens readily. Um, a lot of them would buy uh, uh, surplus lumber. They would construct uh, different structures to keep them out of the sun and keep them out of the rain. You can see a variety of uh, ad hoc. Uh, structures uh, built there at the time from the photo at present. Uh, that's a, a mule drawn water wagon. Again, uh, you, get, uh, it, you get, get rain down there in Cuba. That's another shot showing some of the conditions that the soldiers camped in. Uh, uh, is, as is evident from the, uh, the large puddle that the, the tents are pitched in and over. Uh, marksmanship was an important uh, aspect of military training. Here you can see some soldiers at a rifle range. Uh, a, a diary that I, I read through was written by a guy who remembered making the targets and constructing the, uh, the targets uh, for that range and firing at the range. It ranges up to 200, 300, 400 yards. Uh, guard duty, anybody that's been in the military has probably pulled guard duty. And here you can see the first and third reliefs of the 50th Iowa down in Jacksonville. Mostly what they're guarding against is people bringing things into the camp or soldiers exiting camp to go find a good time without a, an appropriate pass. Uh, there would also be uh, provost marshal details that would go into the different bars and restaurants to make sure that uh, soldiers hadn't slipped out and, and were up to no good. The 51st Iowa served the longest of all of Iowa's uh, units that served during that conflict. Uh, here we see uh, Company M from Red Oak, 51st Iowa Volunteer Infantry. And behind the, uh, the corporal there, you can see a dog. It was a mascot of the unit of Company M called Dewey. And they had picked him up somewhere uh, in, uh, along their travels. And uh, he went all the way with them to the Philippines. In a way, Dewey is the only survivor from the Spanish-American War. Uh, he would come back to Red Oak with the unit after the war. He was kind of a dog about town. Wherever he saw people gathering, he would come running, maybe suspecting to see some of his old uh, soldier friends from that conflict. Uh, he was accidentally poisoned, uh, drank something he shouldn't have, and he was so beloved by the unit that they ended up, uh, they ended up having him taxidermied and uh, he is currently on display at the National Guard Armory in Red Oak. And uh, he, had, he had been injured in a fight with another dog. And as a result, whenever he, he stood, he would position his left rear leg uh, in kind of a backward position. And you can see in this image that he's doing that there. And when they taxidermied that dog back in about 1902, 1903, they put him in that same posture. And again, if you want to travel to Red Oak and see I was only survivor of the war, uh, you're, you're able to do that. Uh, great photo, but I don't, we don't know who this soldier is, the one that was brought to the museum, but uh, it's, he's from uh, 51st Iowa. Uh, the 51st Iowa ends up traveling to the Presidio in California. Again, they encounter disease there, and, uh, the, and they will train there until they're deployed to the Philippines in December of 1898. So Second Lieutenant Matthew Tinley, he would serve in the National Guard from the 1890s until uh, World War II. He would command Camp Dodge during the Second World War. He was well into his 70s by that point in his life. 
served as an attorney and, and a judge, I think, and uh, I think he served as a judge also in Council Bluffs. The 51st Iowa boarding their troop transport, the Pennsylvania in November, 1898. They sail for the Philippines. They would have the misfortune of spending more time on a transport ship over 90 days than any other unit in the Spanish-American War. They would arrive at one port and uh, fighting would break out somewhere else. And commenting on that, uh, the fighting against the Spanish concluded again in August of 1898 in the Philippines, but the, the Filipinos not willing to exchange a, a Spanish yoke for, yoke for an American one, uh, the fighting breaks out in, in April of 1898. And about the time the Iowa troops are arriving there, uh, fighting is breaking out between US occupation troops and Filipino insurgents. And so they would get to one port, no, we don't need you there. They'd get to another port, no, we need you somewhere else. So they ended up sailing around uh, the island of Luzon for, like I said, in excess of 90 days and, and uh, serving a long time aboard that transport, the Pennsylvania. Uh, here they are uh, ashore, Luzon, 1899. And they would be the only Iowa unit to see combat in the Spanish-American War. Again, not against the Spanish, but against Filipino insurrectos. Uh, they would incur two um, two casualties, one was killed on a patrol and another one uh, died in combat serving with an artillery unit on detached service. But you'll notice the troops in the Philippines, one company from every battalion, and a battalion is four companies and uh, four, four companies per battalion, three battalions per regiment. But you'll notice uh, one of the four companies uh, when they arrived in the Philippines was armed with Craig Jorgensen rifle, so these troops here or one of the companies armed with uh, uh, repeating bolt action, 30 caliber rifles. Again, this uh, shot came from a not very good focus, but uh, shows some troops there at uh, San Fernando in the Philippine Islands. They fought, uh, went on patrol and fought a number of times against uh, uh, Spanish, ins or sorry, Filipino insurgents and acquitted themselves well uh, in combat. Uh, Company M, this is 4th Iowa Infantry, they would become the 52nd Iowa Volunteers. This photo was taken in Cherokee, Iowa, upon their departure for Camp McKinley that day. And when the troops left the communities, no one in Iowa had really seen anything like that since the Civil War. And so uh, kids were let out of school, uh, adoring admirers, uh, handed them flowers, and uh, the troops uh, did their best to be uh, to polish, be polished and, and look smart and uh, in, in numerous occasions, cigars were handed out. They went to maybe a local church or a local auditorium or a building for, for breakfast, and they were, were treated like royalty uh, on their departures from these various communities in Iowa, and the same when they returned. Another shot of the uh, 52nd at the fairgrounds or a company from the 52nd at the fairgrounds. You'll notice they have their blanket rolls uh, over their shoulders, and they are, they are holding... Um, Trapdoor Springfield rifles, again, the, the issue weapon for the National Guards at that time. Uh, this, uh, this is a, a concluding slide here, the, uh, a photo of the, the United Spanish War Veterans Reunion. Uh, I think this was taken in Des Moines in 1925. The United Spanish War of Veterans was, of course, a veterans organization uh, created by uh, members of the Spanish-American War, much like the American Legion was created by World War I veterans, and the VFW was also created uh, after the Spanish-American War. And uh, so these individuals here, this must have been, this 1925, so it may have been a 30-year reunion, or, or whatever that would have been, 25-year, I'm not sure, with 27th reunion. But... Uh, that's, uh, again, that's kind of a brief overview of Iowa's participation. Again, the, the lesson to take home is the, the killer of Spanish-American War era soldiers from Iowa, at least in terms of the Spanish, -Amer sorry, at least in terms of the Iowa National Guard units that deployed uh, was disease. Um, at the Iowa Veterans Home in Marshalltown, there's a great statue of a, a Spanish-American War soldier with his blanket roll and he has his rifle over his shoulder and I've oftentimes thought the fitting tribute for Spanish-American War soldiers should be a soldier laying on a cot because the, the majority of those soldiers died of disease. Uh, 
no blame to be assigned there. Uh, medical science had progressed as far as it could by that time. And the, the, the transmission vectors for typhoid fever uh, were only really discovered after the war when they, they analyzed uh, flies could transport uh, the, the bacteria. And uh, anyway, but, but again, the only two Iowans died uh, as a result of combat and those were both in the Philippines. The remainder of Iowa's losses, uh, um, Let's see if I can find. Uh, let's see if I can find the uh, some totals here. The regiments at that time, I've thrown out some numbers here. A company of men was just a little over a hundred, and a regiment was about a little over a thousand, maybe eleven hundred soldiers at full strength. Uh, Iowa's casualties in the uh, the Spanish-American War, uh, proportionally, they reflect those at the national level. Of uh, four, 5,446 Iowans who filled the ranks of the state's four regiments, only two died in combat, 163 or 98% of the lives lost perishing from disease or illness. Uh, nationally, out of 5,400 deaths, only 379 were a result of combat with the enemy, whether that be the Spanish or Philippine insurrectos. Uh, and they, uh, nationally, we lost 92% from disease. So. Uh, Iowa ended up losing a higher percentage from disease than the national average. Uh, I'll, I'll, I like to let veterans speak for themselves when I can. This is a bit of a romanticized uh, quote, but uh, years later after the war in the 1950s, a uh, major Herman P. Williams, who was a chaplain for the 51st Iowa volunteers summarized the events of 1898 and 99 in the role of the Iowa troops within the context of the Spanish-American War, writing, quote, our veterans of the Spanish War deserve the gratitude of generations to come. The bondage of the past was broken and the people set free. We did not see the significance of all these things then, for the God of history leads us only step by step in the path of duty, unquote. Well, that concludes what I have to say. Um, I will, I'm a little little bit new at this. We'll go back a slide there. Um, a little bit new at this. So if there are questions, I'm not sure how that uh, how to proceed from there. Yeah, thank you, Mike. I'll, I'll uh, leave the Q&A for you. Uh, so we have a few minutes. Uh, we have some time to answer questions. We have some questions that came in. Um, but before I pose the first question, I always want to remind our participants that you can still submit your questions through the Q&A feature right there on Zoom. Uh, but no, we may not be able to get to all the questions today. But here's the first question for you, Mike. Uh, do you know of any black soldiers who would serve from Iowa in the war? Yes, but not in the Iowa National Guard. There was a uh, company raised in Des Moines, Company M, that served with the 7th Immune Regiment as United States volunteers. When uh, President McKinley put a call out for volunteers in April and May of 1898, uh, one of the requests was for uh, two cavalry regiments. One would become the Rough Riders, later commanded by Teddy Roosevelt. And uh, of the 10 regiments, four were to be immune regiments. And what they meant by immune, uh, they wanted people that somehow, and how they proved this, I don't know, but they were supposed to, to be individuals that were to be immune from tropical diseases. And as a result, uh, African-American or black soldiers uh, were deemed to be immune to tropical diseases. Of course, that was not the case. But uh, a unit was formed in Des Moines uh, with, uh, there was a white captain, Amos Brandt, and then a, a first lieutenant and a second lieutenant that were uh, voted for, well, I should say, as a, first and second lieutenants were, uh, were black officers. And then the remainder of the rank and file were African-Americans as well and they would go down and serve at a couple different locations in the South, and they were discharged in the fall of 1898, and, and they did not see combat. Now, that stated, the records that we have at Camp Dodge do not include individuals that may have served in the regular army or the, Marine, or the Marines didn't allow blacks to serve at that time. Uh, individuals that may have served in the Navy or may have served in the regular army in the uh, the 24th or 25th Infantry Buffalo Soldiers or the 9th or 10th Cavalry. The Army, of course, is still segregated at that time. Um, 
Iowans may have served in those, un in those units, and I have the names uh, not with me, but of some that did. And there are some individuals buried at, uh, trying to think of the name of the cemetery off university uh, by the golf course. Uh, there's a Spanish American war section and there are individuals buried there that served with the company M of the seventh immunes and also some that served with the Buffalo soldiers in combat in Cuba. Now, a Sam part of that question, um, any stories of Iowa women participating in the war? Not in terms of them being in disguise. Uh, and there, there are some instances of that occurring in the Civil War, uh, not, not uh, in uniform. Uh, however, some did serve in the uniform of the Red Cross. There were also, as, disease, as more and more men started to succumb to disease, uh, volunteers, uh, mothers, sisters, uh, several deployed down to Camp Chickamauga, Georgia, and to Camp Cuba Libra in uh, Jacksonville to, to work as volunteer nurses. Um, if someone wanted to research a Spanish American War soldier, where are the best resources? Um, that's a good question. You have to give me a second on that one. Uh, the, there are published volumes uh, called a uh, roster and record of Iowa soldiers. The majority of those volumes uh, pertain to Civil War veterans, but I think it's the uh, it's volume four, four or five that is a miscellaneous volume, and that has rosters for the Spirit Lake massacre for the Mexican War, and there is a uh, uh, unit histories, regimental histories, uh, and uh, unit histories for the for the eight units that served with the, uh, the Iowa, served from Iowa. Uh, the four that I covered were the National Guard units. There were two volunteer artillery units that were recruited in the summer of 1898. They never were deployed or were sent home. There was a signal company, U.S. Volunteer Signal Company recruited from Iowa that did, do, did, did see duty in Cuba. And then there was Company M of the Seventh Immunes but there are, are rosters and a little, some biographical service data on each individual when they enlisted, what their hometown was, what their age was, uh, if they died, the date, and, and, and what of. And uh, also the adjutant general records uh, for the Spanish-American War. The State Historical Society, I I'm pretty certain, have copies of those, and we have them at Camp Dodge as well. So if you're looking to research an individual soldier, um, there's a good chance uh, that, that, that served in an Iowa unit, there's a good chance that you'll find them in one of those two sources. Uh, next question, uh, do you know how well trained the enemy was in Cuba? <clears throat> That's a good question. They had been on garrison duty and the, uh, the, the Spanish soldiers had been serving and fighting against uh, an insurrection in Cuba since 1895 and they had been fighting against one in the Philippines since about that same amount of time. So as far as campaigning in the field, they were up to the task. Uh, the problem that the Spanish had in Cuba is because insurrections occur all over the place, they had uh, a lot more soldiers than we had in Cuba, in excess of 100,000, but they were spread across the island. So when we landed at uh, uh, Daiquiri and Sibony in June of 1898, and then drove towards Santiago. Uh, there, they just didn't have enough troops, and they couldn't get them transported uh, quickly enough to to stop the American invasion in southern Cuba. Uh, one question we got that I thought was interesting: uh, Did the boys you, who you showed as mascots of the camp do any chores for the camp, like polishing boots and things like that? I, I don't have a, an answer, but I, I'm going to guess they found things to keep them busy. You know, they may have let them help out with, uh, you know, chopping firewood or running errands or probably whatever. I, we have National Guard uh, photos from the 1950s with someone's younger brother or somebody's son dressed up in uniform. So that seems to be a bit of a tradition that extends uh, back at least to the Spanish-American War and uh, as recently as the 1950s and 60s with the Iowa National Guard. There's always something to do. Keep something busy. to do. <laughs> you know, I am for a seven, eight, nine year old to be able to hang around with a bunch of soldiers that have weapons and guns and are marching and saluting. That's that's kind of an exciting place to hang out. Oh, I bet. Uh, we had a few questions about this. Uh, but Hearst papers and other press outlets were agitating a war with Spain. But in your research, uh, can you talk about if you found anything about the press in Iowa 
and what they were like in regard to entry to the war. Say that last part again, please. Yeah, how did Iowa Press respond to the, the, the war? Were they for it, against it? Uh, yeah, they. Um, I, I wrote a master's thesis on Iowa and the Spanish-American War and have continued research on that topic just out of, of natural history. And uh, just, I should say not natural history, it's American history, just out of natural curiosity. And um, the Iowa press by the time of the Spanish-American War, uh, we talk about, you know, yellow journalism, but the editorials that I read and the letters that were written in and also looking at the correspondence sent to the governor, uh, Governor Shaw at that time, uh, the majority of individuals writing in are in support of, uh, of the United States uh, deploying to Cuba and bringing an end to the revolution. And uh, one, you know, one person wrote in their editorial that, uh, it, that they, they wanted to go down and punish the monsters that killed the sailors of the Maine. Uh, there was a, a master's thesis, and an extensive master's thesis about I think four or 500 pages written by a Drake University student in the 1950s that analyzed Iowa's editorial opinion toward the Spanish-American War and he, he reached a similar conclusion. Now, another question we had a few times, uh, in the early part of the presentation, there was a slide with a picture of the fairground on it, and it said ladies walk or ladies wall. And do you know what that meant? Let me, let me scoot back here and put my eyes on it. Ladies walk, I do not. Uh, I've seen that, but uh, I have no idea what that is. Or... We have some people with sharp eyes. <laughs> I, I didn't notice it either until right now. Now, you talked about doing your research. Um, I like to ask people during our, our webinars about the research. Do you have any favorite primary sources you've discovered? Uh, it, it is, uh, I don't want to say this goes without saying, but it, yeah, it's the letters in the diaries. Uh, the anecdotes that come through, you know, they didn't like their sergeant or their clothes didn't fit well. Um, they talk about their daytime activities. In fact, I was introduced to the this this term, a natatorium, by looking at the diary of a soldier that served in the 50th Iowa Volunteers, and he was describing what he would do once in a while. And he said he went downtown uh, to Jacksonville and he, he visited the natatorium. That, that's a that's a covered swimming pool. And no, I had to, I had to, we, we had trouble figuring out what he had written. And so we went to the dictionary and kept coming up with different possibilities. And then finally we realized he, it, it was the term natatorium. So you learn things not only historically about what the soldiers were doing, but once in a while you add a few terms to, the, to your vocabulary as well. Um, some of the, the soldiers talked about uh, the insurrectos always tended to shoot high. Uh, the, the, the Philippine insurrectos wouldn't have had really any training, any basic training to, to estimate distance or, or set battle sites or anything like that. And so the, an officer of the 51st made the comment that, that, the, that the, he's, he referred to them as natives. He said the natives always shoot high. And I've read that in other sources too uh, with reg regarding regular army units that served in the Philippines. So I would say, yeah, in summary, it's, it's letters and diaries because you get, you get the soldiers' experiences in their, their impressions in their, in their very own words. Photographs, of course, are always highly valuable uh, to determining you know, what the clothing was like, what the issue items were like, uh, the weapons that they used, conditions of things, et cetera. This will be our last question, uh, but do you have any upcoming projects at the Iowa Gold Star Military Museum you wish to share? Uh, currently, we're working on an exhibit uh, featuring uh, Iowans' participation in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and uh, also uh, the War on Terror. And so we're, uh, we're crunching on that, and uh, hopefully within the next couple of months, we'll have that wrapped up. That's our hope. But uh, again, we're, we're open uh, Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 2, except for holiday weekends. There's no admission. It's like the State Historical Society. We're, we're here. We're there for you and uh, encourage you to come out and visit sometime if you have a chance. That's fantastic, we look forward to it. Uh, and with that answer, that's the end of the webinar today. I think we can all agree this has been a very informative lunch. I think a ton. 
Um, also, thank you to everyone joining us today. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History Month webinars on Tuesdays and Thursdays in March. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. Now, for more information and to register for future webinars in this series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. And while you're there, you can look into some of our other fantastic digital programs, such as our Bullies Kids Club activities, Drunk Historians, or watch video recordings of the Iowa Story, th sorry, Iowa Story series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. We look forward to virtually seeing you here again Tuesday, March 16th for our fifth Iowa History Month webinar. Thanks everyone.